All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, or good evening or good morning, depending where you are in the world. It's very interesting to be doing a virtual Gen Con this year. Uh, for many, many years, I've done gaming conventions uh, live, so uh, in all, all different parts of the world. And this is, uh, this is a new experience for me doing it virtual. I, I find it to be uh, interesting, and it works out pretty well. Really? So I think in the future, my guess is we're going to see, even after we've got COVID's under wraps a little bit, I suspect we're going to see some hybrid versions of this in the future live mixed with virtual kinds of things. So hopefully everybody can uh, can see my screen. And you should be seeing something that says something about complete Game Master series developing engaging NPCs. So somebody give me a somebody give me a heads up that yay verily you can see it. Yay verily. <laughs> Okay. Yay. Yeah, okay, great. Yay. Okay. So I'm going to launch right into it because we get a lot of material, a lot of fun stuff to talk about. And if you hear a, a little bit of a pause in here, it's because I'm still admitting people who are, who are coming here. So we are going to start off with a little bit of an overview and some definitions. Always good to understand our terms. And then I'm going to talk about the methodology for developing, engaging non-player characters if you're a gamer or non-point of view characters if you're a novelist. <clears throat> and I use the acronym VAMPIRE. This first, uh, this first appeared in print form in a now long defunct magazine that Jolly Blackburn the, uh, of Knights of the Nerd Table fame ran called Shadis. We'll do Q&A if, uh, as that and then we're going to do some bonus material. I'm going to do some bonus material throughout just to, just to make it fun for you guys. So with that, what are we trying to do here? We're trying to explore how to create new and interesting NPCs that it further your plots while being fun. And I want to come back to that point again and again. These, the, these NPCs should help you further your plots, whether you're a game master or a novelist, and they should also be fun for your, your player characters to interact with or your readers. Your readers should ex actually enjoy reading about these characters' exploits. Uh, so that means that there's limits to certain things, right? There's limits, to, there's limits to how horrendous somebody's personality is if, in fact, you want your, your, your readers to enjoy reading about them or your or your players to enjoy interacting with them. In this particular case, uh, we're, I'm going to talk mostly about role-playing, although, again, glad to, and I'll try to talk about tie-ins with novel writing whenever I can. But you're trying to create a world where players can suspend disbelief, and the way they're predominantly going to interact with intelligent creatures is through these NPCs. Uh, <clears throat> now, it talks about two handouts. If you go to the website that you went to to get the URL that got you to the Zoom meeting that you're all in right now, there is a news tab. There is a news tab. And if you go to that news tab, it will tell you where the handouts are, and you can download them from there. And in addition to these Gaming Principles NPC outline, I also have included the slides. So you have access to the slides as well. So, and uh, that's, that's because I was asked about that yesterday. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this slide. I think this is the basis for everything else. In particular, I'm going to talk about the top three principles. So Stafford Principle, named after Greg Stafford. Perrin Principle, named after Steve Perrin. And Peterson Principle, named after Sandy Peterson. And when you think, and the, the first one is Stafford Principle, sense of wonder. And when you think about NPCs, you ought to think about what makes that 
NPC special or unique or memorable, right? That's maintaining a sense of wonder in what you do. The parent principle says you got to be consistent, though. What he or she does has to be logical and reasonable in the context of the world. And finally, Peterson principle, they should be enjoyable to interact with, by and large. NPCs have bad days like the rest of us do. And these things need to be balanced. This needs to be balanced. And we'll talk more and more and more about this as we get into vampire. The, the bottom two, the Stotts principle axiom, uh, Sandy's axiom, have more to do with a kind of a conduct and how you use the NPCs. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop with these top three for this. And you've got this as a handout. You can go back and take a look and think about how these would apply from an NPC standpoint. So I use an acronym to describe the methodology. And that acronym is vampire. So you want varied characters. You want things that affect your players or your main protagonist in a novel. You'd like those NPCs to be multifaceted. If possible, you'd like them to point out what's special about your world, either from a gaming standpoint or from a novel standpoint. They ought to intersect with your main characters, whether those are PCs or whether that's a protagonist in a novel. What he or she does from the NPC standpoint ought to be reasonable, and they need to exist outside of the existence of your protagonist, your player characters. And again, we'll give examples of all of these things. So the first letter is V for varied. Your non-player characters should be unique and easily identifiable. There's nothing worse. Well, there's a lot worse things. One of the annoying things that players run into, hi, overspoke, and readers run into is when, they, when the character is interacting with somebody, with an NPC, and y you as either the player or the reader have no idea who it is. And the way they're talking, you should recognize them. There's somebody that they've run into before, and you have no idea. And there's a lot of ways to differentiate NPCs. By the by, NPCs come in two varieties. We'll talk about this later. I'll, I'll foot stomp this later. But you've got what I would call deliberate NPCs. Those are NPCs that are critical to the plot or are playing mentor or guiding kind of roles, or they're antagonists for your player characters or for your protagonist. And those are the ones you're going to lavish more attention on. But even incidental NPCs, if they run into them more than once, you know, there's the town guard who patrols the market area, that person should be identified. The, the party should know who that is, right? If they're going to run into them again, and if there's any reason whatsoever they're going to run into them, they, they should have some identifying characteristics. So how do you do that? Well, it could be, <clears throat> could be physical characteristics. You know, color of hair, color of eyes. They have something special about their appearance, article of clothing, et cetera. That, for the incidental ones, that, that may be enough. Or it could be some kind of an interesting mannerism. You know, this particular NPC smokes a pipe and they... Whenever they get nervous, they bang their pipe along their ankle or something, or maybe they've got a tick or something. And then again, for the, for the deliberate ones, they may have specific personalities and beliefs that are going to guide them as they take their actions. What's the caution? You've got to be aware of over-differentiation. Uh, and there's two issues with over-differentiation. First, if everything in your world is wildly different, e nothing's different. People are just going to go, I, I can't keep track. I have no, who knows? Uh, this is the guard. I, I don't know. I can't remember all the, every guard is so weird and so different. I don't know. I give up. So that's one danger, right? That's probably the worst one. The other one is also, it, it's, it, it also can derail you a little bit, although <clears throat> there's, there's opportunity in this one. Sometimes if you lavish too much attention and too much description on a particular incidental non-player character, the players may believe that that, player, that NPC is important, and then they'll somehow turn into a, a deliberate NPC. And I've seen, I've seen that happen more than once. And it kind of goes to the novel, novelist rule that if you describe something in the first chapter of the book, it better have some significance later in the book. And, 
and you can kind of say the same thing. There's a, there's a minimal acceptable level of differentiation that every NPC should have. And then there's over the top when you get to the point where now if they don't appear later and they're not important, the players are going to feel a little cheated because they're looking forward to seeing that. And I forget, there was a, if, you, if you think about Star Trek The Next Generation, there was one of the engineering officers who just had a bit role. You know, some guy answered the ad to come on set. He did one thing. The fans liked him. And at first he just had a last name and then he had a first and a last name and then he had a backstory. He went from in that story, in that TV show, he went from being an incidental character to being a deliberate character. And, and that can happen in your novels and your games as well. So, but be careful of over differentiation. You want that more often than not to be deliberate, whether they're a deliberate NPC or an incidental NPC. Effect. So we had V varied effect. The, so this, the party has to feel if they're going to be memorable. Remember our goal is to create these memorable NPCs, not just random NPCs, but memorable ones. The party or the reader has to feel that that NPC has some bearing on the goals of the novel or goals of the game. They have to, uh, they have to, there has to be some attached importance to investing the emotional energy to get to know that NPC. Now, that ability to affect can be either direct and overpowering or it can be subtle. What are some examples? And these are, this is just three. And there's a near infinite, it's only limited by your imagination, but it has to be something that the players or the readers understand. Don't out clever your readers or your players and, and have a way that this NPC affects them that they have no idea because they'll just find that frustrating. You just find that frustrating. You might have to drop hints or something about it. So I would, I would start off more obvious than less. So it may be that that person has information. So this could be a librarian or a sage or a mentor. It could be that they've got an item that they need to complete the quest, you know, the one true ring or, I don't know, um, you know, pick a random worn blade, a uh, storm bringer or something else, a ring of invisibility. It could be that there are authorities in an area that's of interest to those player characters, to your protagonist. But always, 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 if you're going to create a memorable NPC, that person should somehow affect things that matter to your protagonist or your party. All right, bonus material. Remember I told you that you were going to get bonus material. You're a good audience. I really appreciate you guys being here. So I, today, am going to tell you the secret of a happy life. I bet you nobody, like the Spanish Inquisition, nobody expected that there was going to be the secret of a happy life in this presentation, but that's just the kind of guy I am. So let's start this very quickly, but this could change your life. If you let it, it could change your life. So somebody tell me, is this a happy or an unhappy Rich Stott? Somebody, anybody? Unhappy. Unhappy. Very good. Very good. That's an unhappy Rich Stott. And now, is that a happy or an unhappy Rich Stott? Happy. 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 Very. Right. And, oops. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back. Look at that. I was so overzealous that I went. I'm gonna, I'll do one more build. There we go. That's happy and that's happy. Now, let me explain what happy and unhappy is. And I, I admit that I stole this idea. I stole it. But the inner circle, also doubling as a face here, is the things in life that you feel, not that you can or it's absolute truth, but you feel you can control. And this outer circle, outer circle are things that you're worried about. So every time you watch cable TV, what happens to this circle? It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And what about you? Do you feel more and more empowered every time you, you get on a news site or you watch cable TV? No. So there's two ways you can deal with this. The, the more area there is between what you feel you can control and what you're worried about, the unhappier you're going to be. There's two things you can do. You can pull in that circle, and that's if something's here and you absolutely have no control over it, right? 
It's clearly something you have no ability to influence. You need to pull that circle in and let it go. Just let it go. Or, or you can do both, or you can expand your circle of influence. A lot of times you find that things in life, you have a lot, a lot more say about them than you think you do if you just take the time to try to figure out a way to influence them. But clearly some things in life are out here. you got to let those things go. So here's your choice. You can either take charge or let it go. And if you do that, you'll be a happy person. You'll be a happy person. All right. Our next, our next particular uh, letter is M, V-A-M, and the M is for multifaceted. And so your NPC should be, your NPC should be multifaceted. He or she should have their own goals, and they have, should have strengths and weaknesses. One of the dangers, and I'm going to foot stomp this again in a minute, one of the dangers we have is that we'll have an NPC who is all things to all people. He, he or she's all things to all people. They have a million strengths and they have no weaknesses. And sometimes our villains are like that. A much more interesting and memorable NPC is one that has some strengths as well as some clearly defined weaknesses. And not just the weakness that uses to bring them down if they're the villain or the antagonist, but, but a different weakness that has some effect later in your story or in your plot, but may not be the thing that's a dunamwa that brings about the resolution. And hobbies are interesting too. So I don't know how many times over the last 40 some years, 43 years that I've been doing this, when the, uh, a party would come into a place and discover something like a, a butterfly collection or a bunch of pressed flowers in the, you know, the evil, super evil overlord or, or lady, you know, Black's castle. And they go, what the heck is this? Why, why, why does this super evil person have a pressed flower collection? Well, it's because it's their hobby. And it, it, you know what? 40 years later, people still ask me questions about those things because they were memorable. Just because somebody's, uh, you know, on the on the uh, the side of uh, of badness, doesn't mean that they couldn't have an interesting hobby. And by the by, that might if your players are clever, that might lead to that might lead to a way to interact with that that particular NPC. You know, maybe they'll offer a particularly valuable coin for sale as a way of luring that person out or uh you know maybe they they'll spread a rumor about a particularly beautiful butterfly or something as a way of luring somebody out anyway they don't have to be things that influence the plot but often it makes things interesting or they're talking with this person and rather than them going through the soliloquy describing their incredibly nefarious detailed plan maybe instead they go on a on a tear to talk about it how they keep their, uh, you know, how they keep their samples alive to make their sourdough, whatever it is. But it makes it makes these characters memorable. So have real goals and objectives. Have real strengths and real weaknesses, and not just the weakness that's the Donamois producing one. Um, the only thing I would say with this is just pick things that you're comfortable with. Um, there's an old expression for those of you who are writers. Don't write about horses unless you know everything there is to know about horses. And if you don't know a, uh, a, a, if you don't know a dewclaw from a fetlock, don't talk about horses. Because it, what it's going to do is your readers or your players who do know all about those things, when you mention something and it's wrong, it's going to take them out of the moment and they're going to have a hard time pushing the I believe uh, suspense area. So pick things you're comfortable with. That said, of course, there may be something you pick that you want to learn more about. It could be an opportunity for you to do some research and expand your horizons, et cetera. But in general, especially for ad-libbing, pick things that you actually know a fair amount about and are comfortable with that subject material. Okay, the, the fourth letter, P, point out. So what makes your world as an author or your game mastering style unique? And then think about, okay, well, how could you use that in the current adventure or further the plot? So maybe you're fantastic at developing murder mysteries. That is really a strength of yours. Well, well, guess what? 
you, you know, maybe what you're going to do is you're going to bring into the campaign the person that thinks, not that they are, by the way, but thinks that they're the world's greatest detective. So we had a character in one campaign of mine. Was a name of the character was Kabubi, and Kabubi, he wasn't necessarily, but he believed himself. Two things he believed about himself. One is that he was the thought that he was the world's greatest detective, and the second thing is he thought that he could make perfect pasta. Now, how interesting is it? If he's pretty darn good at murder mysteries, but not 100%, and if his pasta is pretty good, but not the best in the world, can you imagine all kinds of interesting kind of fun things that you could do with that and that the party would enjoy doing? And then something you're really, really proud of. Is there some aspect of either your, your world or your writing skills or your ability to game master you're really, really proud of? Maybe you're really good at dialogue, so guess what? Some of your NPCs ought to be pretty chatty then, so you can take advantage of that. Whatever it is, just think about those things and use your NPCs to point those kind of things out. Other examples, let's say you've designed a fantasy world and it uses a very unique style of elemental magic. That's the kind of magic that everything's elementally related. Um, then... You know, one of your NPCs that you probably want your characters to meet early on would be somebody that's a practitioner of this art. If you are really proud of the secret societies that you have in your world and then and how they influence things behind the scenes, the, the player characters ought to run into somebody who's part of one of those. Now, maybe they don't know. But maybe there could be hints. You know, they're wearing a particular item of jewelry or they have some type of uh, iconography on them. Um, and that, that, where did this happen recently in popular culture? In the Harry Potter series, right? They had these things and they had people that were part of these secret societies. But there were little hints dropped about that the fact that they might be part of something special. And here's an acid test for you. Here's an acid test. Imagine that it's 20 years from now and your party's gonna remember one thing about your world, your novel, your campaign, what would that one thing be that you'd wanna pick and pick that and make sure that that is the very first thing that you have an NPC point out, if at all possible. So it's a, it's a great acid test to allow you to focus your efforts. Our next letter is I for intersect. We talked about effect before. There may be NPCs that can affect and have influence over your, your player characters or non-point of view characters that intersect with your point of view character, your protagonist. But if they never interact, if they never intersect, it's the same as if they didn't exist at all. And I would try to make those connections as personal as you can. Maybe they, they share friends in common. Maybe they are competing over something and they're angry about something. There should be some emotional investment. And intersection can happen in a whole variety of ways. Uh, there's some fun things. They could be cooperative. They could be competitive. That could change over time. And I'm going to give you some examples later of how you can morph uh, non-player characters' relationships and intersections with your player characters over time. And see, so you got this shark here, right? This shark could be an NPC, and he or she is luring, <laughs> luring your player characters in in some way. But maybe what the player characters think the relationship is with that NPC are not what they are, and they might be surprised later. Remember, it's got to be logical, though. They got to be able to backward trace it once all is revealed at the end. Otherwise, it's just going to lead to bitterness. Okay, so intersect. You got to find a way not just for them to affect, for them to have potential real, uh, potential real control over something that the players are interested in, but also that you have to figure out a way for them to actually intersect in an interactive kind of way. So an example, I remember I talked before about when we do multifaceted, don't make, you know, Mr. Omniflex. So just, just be careful that you don't make one villain or one, even a mentor character, he or she just too powerful and too awesome. And because 
if if somebody was really you know that good they wouldn't hire the party or they wouldn't interact with the party they wouldn't ask the party to do something they just go do it themselves and the same way if the evil person is just the the, the antagonist is just that awesome um they got to have some kind of weakness they got to be things that they can't do uh because you're not going to want the party to run up against a deific creature first thing out of the box anyway they're they ought to be working through intermediaries. The party ought to get to the point or your protagonist ought to get to the point that they're on a more equal footing with this individual. But I, it's also much more interesting for people to have a variety of people in an ensemble of folks that may have the characteristics you're looking to present as opposed to one person. In some ways, that's lazy game mastering. That's lazy writing. So I think that Omniflex idea is a not, not a good one. And there's different names for it that they use out in the literature. I, I, I've heard this recently, and I'm not about to have a big fight online with you guys about this. I have heard other people say that in some of the more recent popular culture science fiction movies that there may have been Omniflex characters. And a lot of people found that to be, uh, the, the, it put them off. Let's learn from that example and let's not let you make that, let you make that same mistake. Okay, next letter is R for reasonable. All of the actions and motivations that your non-player characters, non-point of view characters, they should all be reasonable in the minds, in the minds of those NPCs. They should make sense and in the context of the world. When they do something, it should have a clear effect. There should be cause and effect. Logically, it happens. This is parent principle stuff, right? It should be make logical sense. There should be some kind of way for people to predict what will happen if somebody does something. That predictability is one of the main things that allows people to suspend disbelief, to shut their eyes and imagine that they're in the world. And, and there's lots and lots of ways to do this in a world building context, but in the context of NPCs, the actions and motivation make sense. And I'm going to foot stomp. I'm going to foot stomp in the context of the world. And I'll come back to the bottom bullet. Uh, one of the big errors I've seen probably in the last 20 years or so, I think it was, it was probably less true 40 years ago when people were doing NPC building, but it's more true in the last 20 years is I see more and more and more non-player characters in settings that are vastly, vastly, vastly different than our current day present world and North America, Western Europe, Australia, wherever you're dialing in from. But you would swear that that creature, intelligent creature from a totally different culture, totally different world, is just somebody from somebody's literature class or local meeting of a political party that got dropped into a world and put on a costume and a rubber head. And there's nothing that's going to break that fourth wall and pull people out of the world quicker than something that's uh, just an iconoclast spouting political uh, rhetoric in a world that it doesn't even make any sense. And your, your, your other players might be polite or just kind of listen to you and go, oh, there, there's Ben or there's Beth, they're going on again about this because you know it's an election year. Oh, I'll just endure it because I, I kind of like some aspects of the campaign and they make a great pot roast, but oh, not this again. Why would this dwarf care about this? Um, don't do it. Don't fall into that trap. Clearly differentiate between your personal political views in this world and what would make sense, what would make sense in the world you're playing in. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that you need to make things that are just the opposite of what you believe in and feel, but whatever those NPCs believe in and feel and have the goals for should make sense in light of the world that they live in. Okay, the last thing is sometimes you know what the cause and effect is and see my little dominoes there at the bottom? This caused this, which caused this, which clearly led to this, and obviously it led to that. But it, that chain of events makes no sense and is completely invisible to your players. And from their perspective, even though the NPC or NPCs, plural, were acting with completely logical, reasonable motivations and courses of action. It's just embittering and frustrating to your players. So do everything you can to telegraph 
why a particular NPC, somebody that the party or your characters are interacting with, does something. And, and sometimes you, it needs to be a secret, but at least after the fact, you need to reveal it to them so they put faith back in your ability to have a, a reasonable world. But this, above all things, is the probably the most important thing for somebody being memorable and also allowing your players and your readers to suspend disbelief. Okay, exists. So your, your non-point of view characters, your non-player characters, they have to live outside of those sessions and they have to have goals and objectives that don't center on your protagonist or your party members. And NPCs need to take actions whether the party does or not. Your world's a dynamic place. That makes it fun. It makes it interesting. It makes it more believable. And it makes these NPCs more believable, too. Uh, I started gaming way back when. It was the first computer games. You'd walk into town. You'd interact in a, you know eight-pixel form. Well, that was high-end way back when, right? <laughs> it was black and white or text. And the NPCs were frozen in amber. You would leave, nothing changed, you came back. Um, and obviously it wasn't very believable. It, it did what it needed to way back when, but nowadays you, people are looking for more than that. I, I'll tell you a couple, couple things that are interesting when you think about Exist, and I'm going to give some examples of this uh, very soon. I'm going to talk about Exist. One of the things that I've used that's been a, a lot of fun over the years, and I, I don't do this every time, but sometimes this has been fun, is imagine that there's more than one adventuring party in the area that your player characters are involved in. There's more than one adventuring party. And adventuring parties aren't always great at wrapping up all of the loose ends. And sometimes they don't always take every mission. One of, the, uh, one of the tropes that I've used over the years, especially with more uh, junior role players, people that may have not done a lot of role playing, is I'll use this concept of, an, of a jobs board. Somewhere in town, maybe it's outside the temple, maybe it's outside you know, the local ladies' keep, there's a, there's a board with, these are the to-do things in the area. This is what it, the job consists of. Here's who you need to go talk to to be hired on. And this is what the anticipated reward is. And a great thing to do with these jobs board to kind of clue the party in that these other groups exist would be they'd come back and say, well, we'll get to that in a little bit. I would rather go to this. They go to that and they come back and it's crossed off the list. They kind of go, what happened? And they'll go talk to somebody and say, oh yeah, well, well, you know, uh, Seamus and his crowd, they did that. You know, we couldn't have those wolves eating those sheep. So, um, you know, they took care of it. I'm sure you guys could have done a better job, but, you know, they did it. So, okay, well, that's fine. That's fine. And one of my favorite, there's, there's kind of two ways that this works out long term. One is the, the party, they've, they've gone and they've done some really cool things. They, they kill the evil undead creature, but maybe a couple of ghouls escape, but they, they eliminated the existential threat to the local population. They, Party feels pretty good about it. They got their gold pieces. But those ghouls are still running around. So somebody had to go take care of that. Maybe they stopped the terrible mage as he or she cast the spell that was going to summon the, you know, the really horrendous creature to this plane of existence. But a couple of the minor summoned creatures got away, and they were still running around. Well, so an example that's happened more than once, more than six times probably in the course of the last 43 years, the party's sitting around, they're feeling pretty good about things, and all of a sudden this party li li limps in, another group limps into the, the inn, and they're, they're looking kind of, uh, you know, kind of beat up, pretty morose, and, uh, you know, they're sitting at a table and they're buying some drinks, and, uh, you know, that, that is an absolute lure. That's one of the absolute lures to engage many, many players. They're going to want to know why. They'll go over there and they'll talk to them and they'll say, those guys, I don't know who this group is, but man, they've left all this stuff undone. You know, first we had to go kill these ghouls to clean up this mess. And then, oh, my, this most recent, there were these two, you know, uh, type four demons that they, they let go. 
And, uh, you know, Norris, our, our party healer, he died. He died fighting these. We're going we're gonna to lay him to rest tomorrow. So we're, we're kind of uh, remembering him and everything else. Most parties and with players with real beating uh, hearts in their chest are going feel, gonna to feel bad about that. And often that's a way for the party to look at somebody who's been doing things in parallel with them and all of a sudden feel empathy for that group and maybe even become cooperative with them. And then it, it, it sets you up for the really, really, really fun session that comes later when somehow it slips that your party, your <laughs> party, were the ones that caused all of these troubles for these other guys. The other thing you can have that's interesting and also an interesting dynamic is that if there's a competing party and the other party knows about the competing party, I recently ran, within the last two years, I ran a little mini campaign where there was actually competing parties hired to try to clean out this extra planar location that a gateway just emerged. It was called the anomaly. And the, the actual player characters met and interacted sometimes with these competing parties. And they really disliked each other. Right? <laughs> and they competed. Um, and that was kind of fun too, because at some point, and this is the other way it happens, these competitors are in clearly in real trouble and outside their depth, and your party, the main party, has to save them. And there's that moment when they're saying, well, maybe we should let them get beat up, and then somebody goes, no, you can't let them get beat up. Um, and then conversely, maybe there's a time later when even though that other party's slightly less competent than your party, they might have to save them and they kind of pay them back. And those make for some really fun, memorable, interesting moments. The one caution I would give you about that is don't make the other party so capable and so competent that your party doesn't feel special. They, they should still feel like they're the most awesome ones around. Even though some of these other parties put a little rust on their luster, they should still feel special. So if the two parties, your party's kind of going up in level, the other party should go up in level two, but not at the same rate. So if your party goes from nine to 10, maybe when your party's kind of halfway to 11th level, these other guys level up, whatever it is, but just don't let the competition get out of hand to the point that your party feels like nothing they do matters. They still have to feel special. And that's a Stafford principle, right? Sparkle, glitter, make everybody feel special. Okay, so we talked about how do these letters work together? I mentioned it early on, I'm gonna foot stomp it again. Your NPCs come in two varieties, incidental, and incidental ones may be just that they're varied, they have different clothing, they have identifiable uniforms, one guy's got a scar, one gal walks with a limp, they've got a tick, just enough so that if they meet, they run to that person again. If there's the same, usually the shopkeeps don't sweep, swap out in a small village somewhere. So if a, if a shopkeep had a particular interest in apples or something, it's an incidental character, still an incidental character. But the next time the party comes in with a big bag of apples from somewhere else, they shouldn't go, huh. <laughs> they, they should be consistent. So again, write that stuff down. Those deliberate characters, though, they're, they're developed over time. But most of the time, deliberate characters don't move to incidental. But I have seen on, on many occasions over the years, not most of the time, but sometimes incidental characters become deliberate. If I was going to think about in Zalandor, in my main fantasy world, the fraction of deliberate versus incidental, I would say that deliberate NPCs are probably less than one in 100,000 in the population. L literally less than you know, one in 100,000 writ large. In the immediate community that the, the NPCs are, or the, that the PCs are interacting with the NPCs, it might be a higher fraction, might be 20% or something. But still, even in their home base, the majority of the people that they're living with and interacting with are probably incidental. Uh, so, and if you lavish too much attention on the incidental ones, they're going to, by definition, become deliberate. And then you're going to have to develop plot lines and everything else around, or the players are going to feel cheated. So I've got some illustrations of some, uh, of some fun characters over the years that have come out and, and using this vampire methodology. So first one is Immel. Immel. Immel ran an inn, and it was in a, a, a very small little 
town. I stole the town directly from Judges Guild way back when, when uh, Judges Guild, you could buy, <clears throat> for $10, you could buy some place that you could campaign in for a decade. So this was one of their little, uh, one of their little modules, and there was Immel was the innkeeper there. And so part of the thing that's interesting about my world is that the players all play in the third age. There were two ages beforehand since the creation of the world. And the, the ages were definitely marked off by, by major, major, major world changing events. And back in the second age, there was something called Kryn, which were these coins that essentially nation states would use to exchange with one another to pay off debts. It was, it was a really a meta world level kind of thing. So a single crin was worth a tremendous amount of money. And it's not something that the local person, uh, no matter how skilled they were, was going to be able to, uh, to, to mint. Now, because this was a very old ancient kind of thing, most people would have never seen this. So, my faithful party at this time, this was back in the 90s when I had a, a group, one of my groups at MIT, they go into these ruins, old ruins, they fight these really ancient, tough monsters. They're feeling pretty good. They're licking their wounds. And the party leader, Eric, uh, he says, uh, he, that, that's the player's name, Eric. He's playing a, a, um, a guy named Phineas. He says to this group, we, we really need a base of operations. We need, we need some place where we can lick our wounds and come back to that we can rely on. And he says, let's, let's do it here. I think there's going to be a lot of stuff. It's right at the edge of the Great Waste. Let's ask this guy, Immel. He seems like a competent innkeeper, you know, innkeeper. And Immel, by the by, is an incidental character, right? You know, but you got to give him some kind of motivation. So I think to myself, Immel really wants, he wants something bigger. Now, I'm not going to reveal this to the party. There's no reason to, because their interactions with him are not necessarily going to be extensive, or at least I wasn't planning on them being extensive. So they come back and they talk to Emil and uh, they say, hey, we'd like to work a bargain where anytime we come back to town, we've got a room that we know is always ours. What would it take to rent that room full time? Emil's not trying to mess him over some, but he's a businessman, right? So he's, if he's going to keep a room available for somebody, he's, gonna, he, he's probably going to give him a discount, right? Because it's guaranteed income. But he's not going to, you know, give it to him at the daily rate for a month or something. So Emil's, you know, he's negotiating. And finally, the party's been pretty beat up. And, and finally, they've had enough. And they just said, you know what? I, I, I don't want to fight about this. I don't want to argue with you, okay? Here you go. Here's a bag of coins. And they knew that these crin, they looked kind of, they had a, a gold kind of sheen to them. And they, they failed their role. When I had them do their research roles, et cetera, they didn't know what they were. They just knew that they were, you know, oh, it's pretty. It's kind of gold colored. And that was that. And they hand them to Emil. And, and to be fair, I, I make a roll. And they don't know why I'm rolling, but I do. And Emil looks at it and he goes, hmm, you know, maybe I misjudge you guys. It, really, this would only normally be enough to last for this amount of time. But you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invest this, what you gave me, and I, you, know, you guys can come here anytime you want, anytime you want. And they all look at it kind of other and go, hmm, what's going on? I mean, the players knew something had happened, but they weren't sure what. So next time they come to town, Emil's got a banquet spread for these guys. It's really nice. Next time they come in, there's, there's been improvements made. You know, he's, he's putting a new wing on the, on the end there, and he's new awnings, he's painted the place. I mean, it's nice, right? Nice furniture. Then they go away, they go out adventuring, and they're literally probably, I mean, way far away. This is six months later in real time. So you can imagine that years have gone by in game, in game time. And they come into a large city, Magrax, which is way up north. I mean, it's really, really a long way away. Um, you know, most people that lived where they were at, where Emil was at, would never even have imagined going to Magrax. It, it was a place almost, not mythical, but it, it was a place, it's like uh, if you live in, uh, I don't know, if you lived in my hometown, Nakusa, Wisconsin, the chance that you were going to go to San Francisco was low, right? Not impossible, but most, peop most people that lived there were never going to go to San Francisco. So Magrax was kind of like that. So a party shows up and they go into town a little bit and they see a crowd gathered around something. And if, 
in addition to having sad people come into a pub, another thing that you can almost always guarantee will spark the interest of your player characters or your players is a is a crowd gathering for some reason. So of course they they're kind of manhandling their way up to the front of the crowd. And who's up on stage with one of the local officials? But Immel. And Immel is opening up his 50th in. And they, Immel sees him and he's like, oh, come up here, guys. I couldn't have done it without you. And they're like, wonder what the heck's going on. And then the story comes out. The story comes up. You gave me a fortune and I've invested it and I, I wouldn't be here without you. And then the party goes, oh, no. but, but it's kind of cool. Even though it would have been cool if they had had that money, although they probably would have you know, spent it on crap. But that's the way parties are. Instead, they gave it to Immel, who's invested. And now there were all kinds of adventures that came out of that. Uh, they had to go rescue Immel's son. They had to uh, take care of some bandits who were interdicting one of his convoys, his caravans. It, all kinds of fun stuff. But Immel, because of that action by the party, went from being an incidental character to a deliberate one, and one that was tremendous amount of fun. And in fact, I, I'm still Facebook friends with those folks years and years and years later. And whenever I've seen them at uh, reunions and things, they, they, they still talk about Immel the Innkeeper. Hellwolf. Hellwolf was always designed to be a deliberate character. So this wasn't, this wasn't kind of uh, serendipity like Immel. But the party would fight Hellwolf. He was, he was a little tougher than they were. But he always fought very honorably and treated the party, even though they were adversaries, with a great deal of respect. So if, uh, if he disarmed one of the party members, he'd back off and allow the party member to pick up his or her weapon again to engage him. Um, he, would, he, would, he would agree and, and uh, live by bargains and, again, behaved in a very honorable way. And eventually the party said, there's more to this guy. He's not some, you know, he may be a villain, but I, I, I feel like there's more to this. So they snuck. They said, Kent sent a couple of their sneaky people into a camp where Hal Wolf was uh, was clearly from and they overheard a conversation where the big bad person is threatening hell wolf and you come to find out that hell wolf's sister who he loves dearly has been kidnapped and is being held as a hostage as a leverage over hell wolf and it created this really cool situation where now a potential adversary and the party still they couldn't let on that they knew had to treat this adversary in a different way and eventually they figured out a way to go rescue Hellwolf's sister, and then he became an ally of the party. So pretty cool. But, you know, there were those hints, be based on the vampire model, there was hints that Hellwolf would drop. Baron Stewart, uh, another deliberate NPC. The interactions, though, I didn't predict. I just, I just made Baron Stewart have a very snarky personality. He was kind of like a, a rabid porcupine. He just was no fun to be around. He was always nasty to the uh, player characters. Uh, would say would say sarcastic things, was demeaning, would represent them poorly in public venues, just was was mean to them, right? So the <laughs> so my player characters just automatically assume, ah, clearly this guy's evil, right? Because snark equals evil, I guess. Well, no, not the case. Baron Stewart was actually a really good hearted, good hearted person, it, but it was he didn't have a great personality. Um, so eventually the party, one of the ways I reward parties is not just through experience points and gold and that type of thing. I almost always over time, give them more responsibilities in the world. So they may become minor officials. They may be given responsibilities to do certain administrative requirements by, by higher ups and areas. And it makes them more engaged in the world. And it's also kind of real, right? And then you don't run out of ways of rewarding people. So the, the party leader had been given responsibility for administration of this part of this, this duchy. But they're called away to do a really important mission, and it was really clearly an important mission, and they had to go do it. And they, they were the ones who had the skills and the abilities to do this. So the, uh, the ruler there says, you know, while you're gone, somebody's got to run this particular area. And I'm going to have Baron Stewart do it, you know, because he's a good guy and he's smart and he's clever. So the party's freaking out, you know, they're going to put this evil guy in charge. Oh my gosh. You know, by the time we come back, they will be undead roaming the streets and there'll be, you know, orcs swinging from the chandeliers and he's going to, 
he's going to turn it into, I don't know, Mordor, right? That was, <laughs> it was just really nervous. So they very reluctantly went to do their mission. And they were very cautious, and they, they were always trying to find ways to came back. Of course, I tried to stymie those in any reasonable way I could. And it was just, it was just fun to see the anxiety about this other thing, so these competing interests. And eventually, a couple of them snuck back. They were like, I can't take it anymore. I got to know what's going on. I got to know what's going on. And they went back and, man, everything's functioning well. And, and looks like some of the things are even in better repair. And the morale of the local people is, is very good. And they're like, what the heck's going on? Oh, no. He's charmed them all. He's, <laughs> he's got some uber powerful artifact that's affecting them. You know, and it's, it, just, it just grew and grew and grew. As opposed to the Occam's razor explanation was, hey, maybe we misjudged Baron Stewart. So they eventually come back. They've done the thing. Baron Stewart actually sponsors a big, big celebration for them. He very willingly relinquishes control of the area back to the, uh, the, the, the uh, party leader. And they, they all have a heart to heart. And he says, oh, you know, well, I'm sorry you misjudged me. And there's some backstory for why Baron Stewart is the way it is. And eventually the party is now going to help him resolve some unresolved things from his past. They become friends and allies. Super fun story. By the by, this took place because Baron Stewart was this exquisitely crafted NPC. This story took place over literally probably six, seven months of playing time. So again, kind of years of game time, really fun. Uh, those of you who have ever played in the Lovecraft universe and done Call of Cthulhu or other Mythos-inspired games, which is a lot of them now. There wasn't a lot when back in the 70s and early 80s, but there's a bunch of them now. So the, the Migo are, are a villain race, right? They're a, a villain group of intelligent species. They sometimes call them the fungi from Yogath. And they're, they're technologically advanced, but they do things like take people's brains and put them in jars. You know, generally unpleasant. No, nobody really wants to be a brain in a jar. So <laughs> sometimes players bring meta-knowledge to sessions. I'm, I'm sure that none of you have ever seen this. None of you have ever seen people using meta-knowledge that just happened. The young peasant girl just happens to know that this is the way you kill a vampire, right? Yeah, probably not, but how are you going to stop your player from using that knowledge? There actually are ways, but that's another seminar. So these Migo, they were just really lonely. They were out in outer space a long time. They just, they just wanted to interact with some people. And there were, there were villains in this particular setting, but they weren't the Migo. The Migo were just there to, to have fun, to interact. They were kind of like an away team from Star Trek, right? And they were just lonely. So the party sees these and they use their meta knowledge and these are bad. And so they're, when they see the Migo, they're, they're observing them. They're trying to figure out ways they're going to battle them, et cetera. Whereas the Migo are super technologically advanced and they're just, at first, they're just puzzled. Well, at first they're curious, right? Why are these people hanging out? We detect them on our life sign readers. You know, they're over there. Oh, maybe they're, they seem pretty intelligent. Maybe we can, you can interact with them. So the party, of course, is interpreting everything the Migo because they're not communicating directly, they're only communicating through actions, everything they do as somehow nefarious. And this, these kind of uh, misaligned expectations versus reality led to a lot of really, really fun situations. And eventually, of course, they figured it out. You know, eventually they figured it out because one of the party members was really, really badly injured um, because they were trying to sneak into something and they got caught in a trap or something. And then the really bad guys attacked them. And who rescues them but the Migo? And the Migo kind of, the Migo patch them up. And then the rest of the party members are sitting there thinking, oh no, they're taking their medical center because they're going to take out his brain. <laughs> but that wasn't it at all. They were just trying to patch him up. And it, it, just, it just made for a lot of fun. And guess what? You know, 20 some years later, people still talk about that. That's a fun thing. Um, Ob was a uh, he was a lawyer, and uh, he was sent by one of the people that the party in this particular campaign was mildly opposed to. Uh, he was he was uh, Ob worked as a henchman for a nobleman, and the nobleman was kind of sort of a bad person. I mean, he wasn't the big evil guy, but he really didn't like that the party had as much influence as they did. He was doing some kind of shady things inside, and he was not happy. 
that the party was going to eventually probably figure it out because they were kind of goody two shoes. And so he sent OB, who was literally a lawyer, literally, <laughs> that was really his job, and uh, to go keep an eye on the party, et cetera. Uh, and the way he did that was by offering services. But the party, of course, was suspicious of him. Now, OB, deliberate, and PC. Eventually, a series of things happened, and, and OB is, is um, he's eventually made into a pit fiend. This, this happens off stage, but the party is very much aware of it, and they may have had something to do with why it happened. So they're kind of responsible for it in a way. I mean, they didn't actually map this out, but the, the series of, of, of unfortunate events, to steal the title, that, uh, that led to this happening were probably the party had some influence on. They, they, didn't, they never planned on turning OB into a pit fiend. That kind of happened. But there was a lot of ways that that wouldn't have happened if they had done different things. Let's put it that way. Anyway, OB is now a pit fiend. He's a super powerful extraplanar creature. But he still views the party, who he's helped out on several occasions as allies, but the party really, really doesn't like OB. And so this was a very, very, very interesting dynamic that went on for two years, two plus years of game time. Eventually, uh, the party was commissioned to go kill OB because he's a pit fiend, right? Though so that's what you do with pit fiends. And, and then it was finally resolved, but it was just, it was just comical as Obi's, and it, it's related to the Migo in a way, right? As Obi's trying to help him out and do things for him and making deals with him, but he's still a pit fiend, right? So you probably don't want to make deals with extra player creatures, et cetera. But it was fun because he started off as this deliberate NPC who was kind of sort of on the shady side of things, but, but really still helped out the party, but they didn't like him. And then it, it just kind of, it kind of escalated, escalated. And at every step, the party had something to do with why that escalation occurred. So this is just some examples of if you use the vampire methodology, you can come up with some really, really cool, fun, and memorable characters. All right. So here we go. Another bonus. Another bonus for you guys, just because that's the kind of guy I am. I'm going to talk about Romance 101 for gamers. So. You're, try, you're trying to get you know, the man of your dreams, the woman of your dreams, the partner of your dreams, whatever it is. This is a sure, foolproof method for, uh, for helping to increase the romance in your life. And I'm going to ask for open mic at this point. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be asking for input, and I'm going to want some input from you guys. So I bet you that nobody thought, but if you think about it, romance kind of fits directly with NPCs, right? With NPCs and romantic encounters and that kind of thing. So it really actually fits very much with the topic, but I bet you that nobody predicted that you were going to see this. So here we go. Now, notice that I, I have it labeled at the bottom, so I don't want you spreading this with just everybody because this is for official use only, and I'm deputizing you to use this today. So it's unclassified. I'm not giving you any, any secret or top secret material, but this is, I don't want you abusing this knowledge that I'm going to give you. So everybody agree to that? Peter, is that okay with you? Sure. Amanda, you're not going to share this with just anybody, right? Nope. Okay. <laughs> all right. Very good. And I, I'm going to assume the same for the rest of everybody else, Davey and Emilio and James and JJ. All right. So I'm sharing something with you now that's going to be very, very powerful, right? This is like an artifact. So here we go. So it's a pyramid. It's called the Romance Pyramid. And if you apply this, this I'm telling you right now, um, it's and it's it's independent of, of, of gender or orientation or anything else. It works with everybody. I'm just telling you right now. So here we go. So the bottom line, literally, <laughs> right, the base of the pyramid is for any good relationship, for any good relationship, the people involved need to feel safe and they need to feel secure. And they need to feel safe and secure physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And I'm going to add politically, too, because that's become a deal. So they have to feel safe. And I want you to think about these. If you look at the dashboard on your car, right? If you look at the dashboard on your car, safety, safety is kind of like this idea of a roadmap. It's a longer-term kind of thing. It means 
I feel good about this. This relationship has a future. This person's invested in me and they're, they're going to look out for my long-term welfare. Security is instantaneous. Security is at any moment in time. I don't think this person's going to attack me verbally or physically. They're not going to say some mean things about my political or spiritual views. They're not going to belittle me in public. So safety is that long-term. I feel like there's some was-was here in this relationship. And security is at any given point in time, I feel that I'm going to be okay. And I, I think we would all agree. Now, that doesn't say there can't be excitement or anything else. And we don't, I'm going to keep this G rated, right? So I'm just going to say it doesn't mean that there can't be excitement and other things. But in general, you want people to feel safe and feel, feel secure. So that's our, that's our baseline. That's probably true for friendship, too. It doesn't have to be romantically inclined. Now we're going to up it to special friends and, and partners, all right? So the next layer up, the next layer up is feeling desired and feeling special. Feeling desired and feeling special. What does feeling desired mean? Feeling desired means that you convey to this person that you're interested in them. You're interested in them physically. You're interested in them intellectually. You care about their opinion. You want to know what their interests are and what their desires are. You want to learn about them. And and you desire that. You want to spend time with them. And it's important to you, and you get utility, and you show that. You show that by spending time. You show that by encouraging them with gifts. You say nice things about them in a public environment. Um, it, all of those things that you do to show them that you appreciate them and that you desire their company and their time. And that's important. I think that's important also for friends. Not, not everybody. I think everybody you ought to make feel safe and secure, right? Everybody you interact with. Unless they're actively trying to kill you, which happens in my life sometimes as an army officer. So I don't really have any interest in making somebody shooting at me feeling safe and secure. Unless I'm trying to fool them so that I can disarm them or something. But in general, in dealing in civil society, I want everybody to feel safe and secure. Feeling desired, I kind of leave for my, my friends and or partners. And in my particular case, beloved Anne, my better half. So interesting way that I make her feel desired is I refer always to my other half as beloved Anne in public settings. Um, and, and usually when I'm talking to her, even internal to the family, I call her beloved Anne. Uh, and, and why? Because... If, so if James or Eric or Diana or any of you or Christy runs into Beloved Anne in the future, you're going to say, oh, I remember Rich talked about you, Beloved Anne. And how do you think that makes Beloved Anne feel? That makes her feel appreciated and desired. All right, so feeling special is another. It's related to, but it's not synonymous with feeling desired. And what feeling special means is that your partner, that object of your romantic desire You do things for him or her that you simply would not do with or for somebody else. So there's a famous example where it shows, you know, the the husband gives the mom a big bouquet of roses and the little girl standing right next to her. And then he takes one of the roses out of the bouquet and he hands it to the little girl. And you all go, oh, that's so sweet. And I go, oh, no. Because he just took away from that very special thing, that very special thing that he was doing for mom, that he gives her flowers, and now he's giving flowers to the little girl too, and now it's way less special. Neither of them feel special. If instead he pulled out of his pocket a stuffy, a little teddy bear or something, and gave it to the little girl, that's okay, because maybe he only gives little stuffed animals to the little girl, or he has a little knick-knack or something but he shouldn't take away from the special thing that he does for the mom, okay? Now, think about feeling special and rewards and gifts. It's, it's random reinforcement is, makes all the difference in the world. So I don't know if you all know or not, but I'm actually not the most famous Dr. Stotts. I, I, I am saddened. I am saddened to tell my audience today, I am actually not the most famous Dr. Stotts. I am very sad about that. 
The most famous Dr. Stotts is a guy named Arthur W. Stotts. He is a sextologist who works in Hawaii. Ladies and gentlemen, I cannot compete with that. I cannot compete with that, but I can learn from him. So one of the things that Arthur W., Dr. Stotts, when he says, is that if you want to improve your relationship, you shouldn't do really special things for people all the time. You should do them at random intervals. So don't give you know, your better half flowers every time you come back from somewhere because after a while it gets to be blasé. It's expected. Just do it randomly. Don't mow the lawn for your other half every week as a, as a chore, if that's their chore. Just once in a while, just do something nice and do it randomly. That will actually, it will, just based on human psychology, it's really not just human psychology, so it's really mammal psychology, that will make them feel special quicker and with more lasting effects than anything else. So feeling safe and secure, base of the pyramid, you're not going to go anywhere if somebody feels unsafe or unsecure with you. And then feeling desired, and there's a whole variety of ways, physically, spiritually, mentally, that they make them feel desired. And then feeling special, and you make them feel special by doing nice things for them, saying nice things about them, saying nice things to them, spending time with them, whatever their love language is, right? There's five love languages. That's the feeling special part. All right, so now there's a secret. There's a secret that's at the top of that pyramid, and I'm going to take... And some of you have probably been in, oops, some of you have probably been in, uh, have probably been in lectures with me before, and you might know it is. So if you know what it is, don't give it away. But if you don't know, I, I would like you to take a guess, and we're, we're going we're gonna to take a bunch of guesses before we find go. So who's got my first guess at how do you get from level two up to, to the third level? Anybody? Oh, I'm going to call on people if somebody doesn't volunteer. Personal sacrifice? Um, that would be a feeling special thing. That would be a feeling special thing. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a good way of making somebody feel special. If you do something that you don't necessarily like in order for them to feel special and appreciated. And one of the things I would tell you about relationships. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, would it be familiarity, perhaps? Familiarity is also part of feeling desired. The more you ask about them and get to know them. To who said what? How about feeling understood? Feeling understood goes with feeling desired. It's learning more about them, right? And then doing special things for them based on what you learn about them it makes them feel special. Anybody else? I'll do two more and then I'll do a big reveal. I'm, I don't mean to be a big teaser about this. Anybody else? Feeling equal? Uh, that, that's also with feeling desired, that, that feeling that you're a peer and that you're appreciated based on your abilities and contributions. All right, one more, one more guess, anybody. I'm going to pick on somebody if you don't. Well, here. Commitment. Commitment, um, that's a good one. Commitment really goes with feeling safe, Right. Feeling that there's a future in it, having that roadmap that they're with that, that's a commitment piece of that. And it also is with feeling special. If there's only things that they do with you, it makes you feel like there's some commitment there. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna do my big reveal. Everybody right here we go. What leads to romance is fantasy. Fantasy. Now remember I'm gonna keep this G-rated. We're gonna keep this G-rated. But I, I'll define in a G-rated way fantasy. Fantasy is when you do things and you say things that that person is longing and looking forward to do with you. And it's that little aspect of surprise. They're not exactly sure what you're going to do. And it's, hey, I can't wait. Something's coming. Something's coming. It's, I don't know. It's probably pretty close. And now you've got your partner here. She's thinking about it. They're thinking about what does the future hold? What is Rich going to do? What's Sarah got in mind? What is... What is Shannon thinking? What is, what is Yorkus Rex going to do for me? Whoever it is, Sam. It, and it's that aspect of having anticipation, positive anticipation, and doing things that add a fantasy element so that it's not, it never gets to be routine, and, and, and it can be big things and it can be little things. And, and 
I've got a million tricks for dealing with that, but uh, I'm going to leave it there for now. But again, please don't misuse this secret knowledge that I've shared with you today. Super powerful. But, you know, with, with great knowledge and capability comes great responsibility. So I'm asking you to use this responsibility responsibly in your romantic lives. All right. And with that, I am going to open it up for any questions, comments, or thoughts that you have. So I, uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we'll just, uh, well, I can leave the question mark up. It doesn't matter. So who's got, who has got my first question? And I, I'd prefer if you'd ask it out loud because I'm not sure everybody has access to the chat window. So if you've got a question, we've got about 21 minutes left. Uh, we can take as much or as little a time of that as you guys want. Yes, so we'll, I have a quick question. I live to serve. So I can see the recording button going. Will the recording button be available? Will the rec recorded session be available sometime? It will, and but here's the deal. Since none of you have signed a, a waiver with me, I'm going to edit it. And so any time that there was participation from the audience, I'm going to have to cut that part out just for, uh, well, for a whole variety of reasons. So yep, uh, thank you. You bet. Anybody else? Hey, look, so Shannon, look at this perfect example. Shannon's going to go pick up her husband who landed in a field. I bet you he's going to feel special. Shannon, did you learn anything that's going to help you today in your relationship with your hubby? You might already be gone. All right. Who's got my next question, comment, or thought? So you mentioned that one of the biggest pitfalls for NPCs is like making them too powerful. Are there any other large pitfalls that come to mind when you're trying to make memorable characters? Um, yeah, there's, I mean, there's, there's bunches of them. We could, we could talk about that for three days. So um, yeah, too powerful is one of them. Uh, another one is just dull that they're uninteresting. They don't have, they have, they're there as a foil. They're a cardboard character. Uh, they're, they're, you know, they make cardboard feel special because they're so dull and boring. So making them interesting and flamboyant and, and interactive. Um, it's just for each one of the, for each one of the letters in the acronym, you could imagine, um, let me go back. Let's see, go back to the interactive one. Let me see. I got a chart that's got them all, all listed on there. <laughs> That I had at the end. Yep. Maybe not. I'll go back all the way to the beginning where I had it spelled out. Yep, there we go. So, I, yeah, mistakes people make is that this, uh, this noble person's super important to the party and uh, you've lavished attention on them, but you, you don't figure out any way for them to actually intersect with the party. They're sitting in some castle or keep somewhere and he or she never leaves it. And there's no way for the party to interact with them. That's a that's a that's a big fail. Um, irrational, you know, that they do things that aren't reasonable. They do things to advance the plot because the party did something unexpected. And your way of dealing with the plot derailment is by having the uh, the the NPC do something that's out of character. That's another. That's a huge mistake. Um, I think another big one, and I I'll, I'll foot stomp it again. Garvin's Law says you got to hear something six times before it sinks in. The, the reasonable piece, um, don't drop 21st century sensibilities and views into a medieval character. Just don't do it. It just makes no sense whatsoever. Um, yeah, go ahead. Somebody was going to say something else. Go ahead. That must have been me. Um, did did that answer? Me just saying that it's not just um, medieval, you could drop it into, I do pulp in a 50s game. Yeah, it, perfect. It's the example. same thing. Yeah, it's exactly the same thing. Well, and, um, and so I told you that, so Beloved Ann recently got into Outlander and uh, we're watching it. And by the by, um, I know also know when to be silent, right? So sometimes you, you could see that they were violating a lot of the premises of Vampire and the people she's interacting with, the non-point of view characters. And a bi the biggest mistake they make in that is this supposed to be post-World War 
one, but yet these people, even in ancient Scotland and in the World War I era, uh, were thinking and saying and doing things that made no sense in light of, of societal customs and norms at that point. So uh, th it's a big issue, and, and a lot of people violate it. But now that you've gone to my seminar, please don't you do it. Did, did that help in terms of, um, of things to avoid or big mistakes? Yeah, it did. Thank you. All right. Who's got my next question, thought, or comment? May I uh, ask a question? You may. I'm here for you, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, so uh, my question is a bit more from, I guess, the macro level. Um, so I have recently concluded uh, a long-term campaign, and by the end of it, it was highly political. Tons of NPCs, a huge stable. And by the end of it, it was kind of, I guess, a little frustrating and disappointing to manage so many NPCs. And also, even though a good part of them I felt were memorable, people started to forget. Do you have any kind of like advice on managing more than, you know, like NPCs in the campaigns that are not about a small scale adventuring party, you know, something a bit bigger? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So remember I talked about that ratio? The vast majority of NPCs in your world, by definition, are going to be incidental NPCs. And just resist the urge of over differentiating your incidental NPCs because if you do, there'll be an expectation on your part and on the part of the of the players mm -hmm. that those will have to be deliberate and they'll have to remember them. But what you did is you you consciously made a lot more deliberate NPCs than were manageable. Remember that here's a rule of thumb, and this goes back to psychology. Most people can remember about 55 people. And that applies both to the real world and that applies to your gaming world. So I, I would keep careful track of how many NPCs I introduce to them. And when you start getting up above about 40, I would start thinking about dropping some of the people off of the roles. And by the by, what you're learning in this seminar can apply to your real life too. So if you're a manager or a middle manager in an organization and all of a sudden, and all of a sudden, they're going to create an organization that goes from 50 people where kind of people everybody knows and trusts each other, et cetera, um, then uh, I would find ways of breaking it down. I mean, we all talk about flat organizations now and how sometimes that's magical and that if you have 700 people reporting to one person, oh, that's better because that's flat. No, because there's no way that one person can possibly remember and relate at a personal level to 300 people. It's just not possible. You got to break it out it, where you've got somebody who's a, a direct supervisor or a manager or involved with them from a, a, a chain of concern or a leadership perspective where it's a much smaller group. And you see this happen in churches. You see it happen in, in uh, you know, production organizations, whether they're factories or uh, anything like that. Uh, somebody asked me where I have the source for 58 people. Not off the top of my head. It's a, if you do a, a Google search, if you do a, a, a LexNex search on number of people that you can remember or interact with on a, on a personal level, on a personal level, that that number will come back. Fifty-five is um is kind of a, but but I do not know what the provenance is off the citations off the top of my head. I it, I've been using it for forty years, so it's it goes. Uh, it's not something that's come out in the last two or three years. It's it's old, but uh, if you find out, send everybody an email about it or a, a message, and uh, that would be good for everybody. But I don't know what provenance off the top of my head. But I would say that I would I would actually keep track, and when the number starts getting large. Um, though, then those NPCs that were there for a time and interesting and fun for you, I'd start not retiring them. They're still in the world, but don't plan on bringing them back because your party's not going to remember more than that. And you just have to be, as the game master, have to be very deliberate about how many you introduce to them. And if there's, if there's, um, did you ever see, did you ever see uh, Game of Thrones? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. So in the books, 
in the books, Tyrion, right, who was the, really the point of view character, right, uh, played by Peter, Peter Dinklage, mm-hmm. in the books, he was, uh, he had many, many women. Every town, every adventure, every chapter that started off with Tyrion as the title, he, he was with, he was drunk and he was with a different woman. What did, what did the writers cleverly do for the TV show? Um, they, uh, they condensed all of the women to, what's her name? Shane? Shani, exactly. Yeah, like exactly. Yeah, exactly, Turk. They, exactly. And why did they do that? Um, to make it more appealing, to see him, make him appear more wholesome, but also because there's no way that the audience was going to be able to keep track of 60 different women that he was going to be with. In the, over the course of seven seasons. They did that with all of the nobles as well. Everyone was represented by just one person. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So, so you, see, you see the model, right? And if you think about people that you could name in Game of Thrones, um, you know, probably all of us could name 20 or so, but there were probably only about 50 characters who were actually memorable characters from the tv series and they did that deliberately and that, that's what i would say uh, miles yeah yeah exactly so uh, paul wrote to everybody the the next generation character was chief miles o'brien exactly yeah exactly he was exactly what i was thinking of and he was turned into a uh, deliberate npc by the fans who were like i want to see more of that guy i want to see more of that guy yeah thank you thank you very much paul so Derek, does that help Absolutely, yeah, it does. And you actually do highlight, uh, by, by saying, talking about Game of Thrones, you just gave me the perfect way of transplanting this novel-esque background and world-building into something that you can present to a player. Because what I did in the game was, oh, here's the, there's like 122 houses, and here's like the families and their lineages, and it's like, I just don't really care. <laughs> yes. end, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're exactly right. Yeah. Thanks a lot, right. Yeah, All right, you. you're well. I live to serve. Say say nice things about me. Lie a little if you have to. Who's got my next okay. question or comment? Anybody? All right, we've reached my thirty seconds of awkward silence. So, I am going to uh, be respectful of your time. I really, really, really super appreciate everybody participating in the uh, seminar today. I am going to put this out on my YouTube channel, um, and the way you get to it is, uh, and, and I'll put it out in the news, uh, the news tab, uh, just like I did with the downloads. Once I get it done, just uh, just uh, to manage expectation a little bit. Um, between now and Sunday, as most of you are, I'm running like crazy, and then starting on Monday, my Monday begins with a, a military funeral at Arlington, and uh, the the kind of week goes downhill from there. So it's. Uh, I would say realistically, it's going to be a week from Monday before I have a chance because I'm going to I'm going to edit everybody else out, uh, and I'm going to try to tighten things up and make sure the sound is good and all that kind of thing. Is that that takes a little bit of time? So I'd rather put out a quality video a little bit later than immediately. So be, but my I'm not taking down the seminar site. It's not going to come down uh, for a while. And in fact, uh, some of you have been at some of my other parts of my site. See, that some of it's under construction based on the, some things that have that happened. Uh, and I'm planning over the next probably month or two to bring that back up too. But thank you so very much. Say nice things about me. Give uh, good re- good reviews, and maybe they'll invite me back next year. So have a great day, everybody, and thank you again so much. I really appreciate being here. Have a have a great four days of gaming. Thank you, sir. You as well. All right. All right. All right. Thank Bye-bye. you. It was a it was a wonderful seminar. I'm glad you guys liked it. Have a great day, everybody. Bye bye.